Patsy. If you're not looking in his direction, continue on. Patsy. Found him, Master. Brought her back, just as instructed. What'd you just now tell her? What'd you say to Pats? No words were spoken, none of consequence. You're a liar. You're a damn liar. I saw you talking with her. Tell me. Can I speak of what did not occur? Oh, Class Black, bro! You come here. Master, I thought... Master, come here! I brought her back, just like you said. Come here! Master! So, um, let's welcome the cinematographer for this year's Academy Award winner for Best Film, Sean Bob at BSC. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. So, who won the Academy Award last night? <laughs> All right. All right. Best picture. So, are you still high from it? Are you still <laughs> drunk? Did you? Uh, how well, did you celebrate? Tell well, us. I, I, actually, my parents live in India, um, so I watched it with them. Are you kidding and me? We, I think we had three bottles of champagne. So. <laughs> Just a little bit hungover still, but, um, but no, it was a, a fantastic evening. Stressful yeah. though. <laughs> I mean, having to wait till the very, very end I know, once again. I know. I know. But you know, we're very pleased, very excited. So how how did you get your parents are from India? Uh, live in India? What did you say? Indio. 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 <laughs> Outside of Palm like, Springs. I was like, okay, he went to India and he arrived today. Um, yeah. yeah, so you are Yankee, and how did you end up in England and become well, a British cinematographer? It, it, it's a very long story, um, but basically my father was in the oil industry, and I grew up all over the world and spent most of my childhood in England. And, have, you know, I keep finding myself back in England, so that's my home. <laughs> so... Um, I'll ask the generic questions and then I'm going to open up to the um, chair of the cinematography and the cinematographer students because that's really their chance to be here with a world class uh, cinematographer. So, um, how did you, you worked on three movies with Steve McQueen and, um, and maybe even art installations before that? Yeah. So how did you hook up? I want to know both in terms of like, how did you meet? And also what it was like to start working with somebody on art project, because it's not narrative, you know, it's mm. something totally different. No, I think um, I've, I've been very fortunate. I've worked with Steve for 13 years. Um, and he, it was actually his wife um, who kind of put us together. They had seen... She seems to be really very, on top of it. She found yeah. him the book, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, she's, she's an important I lady. I divorce that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they had watched, uh, they'd watched Wonderland together, the first feature hmm. I did, of Michael Winterbottom's film. And at the end of it, she had said, you should be working with him. Because um, at that time, Steve was doing his art installation work and was looking for a, a cinematographer to work with. So he tracked me down through my agents. We got together. We had tea um, in central <laughs> London, a very civilized thing to do. I thought he was completely barking mad and could barely understand what he was talking about. Um, but also thought that he was, he, was, he was either an absolute genius or an absolute lunatic. Yes. And either way, it was going to be interesting doing something with him. <laughs> um, so he had an idea um, which became a, a, a work called Western Deep which is one of the things I'm proudest of ever having worked on. Um, it's set in the, the bottom of the deepest gold mine in the world in South Africa, which is almost two miles underground mm. and takes two hours to get to an extremely um, uh, dangerous and unpleasant <laughs> environment. And we, we had spoken for, for months about the project beforehand. That's the great thing about Steve. He's, he's really he's a great collaborator and he, he loves to share ideas. Um, and to hear other people's ideas. So we had spoken about, you know, the politics of South Africa, the, the concepts of, 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 even in those times, uh, you know, a black um, miner was basically a slave, um, historically. 
and the, the life um, in the mines was very difficult and very dangerous. Um, and so we were there to, to explore um, all of the, the politics, the geography, the history, all of these ideas um, rolled up into, and that was the thing. It, was a, it wasn't, like you're saying, it, it's not a narrative. You know, it's not linear, it's art. And I can remember getting down on that first morning all the way to the bottom, which took two hours. Mm -hmm. um, and they put 4,000 people into the ground every day. I mean, it's enormous, the whole project. And we got to the bottom, and I turned to him, I said, okay, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, there's something here, let's find it. And I almost hit him, because, <laughs> you know, you're in the most hostile environment in the world, outside of a war zone. And, you know, I come from the world of, of the narrative, of the linear of you know having having a, a specific goal visually to achieve and suddenly that was all taken away and initially i was lost I thought, oh. and after a little while i oh, just sod this you know just go shoot something and within minutes of starting to shoot i realized what a gift this was because it is it's total and complete creative freedom you are unfettered. Whatever you do is right, simply by the fact that you were there. Um, and it became uh, the most amazing experience um, and has marked me forever as a cinematographer. Um, and I kept wanting to go back. We were only allowed to go down for two days. I was like, oh, let's go again, let's go <laughs> again. Um, because suddenly, you know, all of the years uh, that I had done before as a news cameraman, as a documentary cameraman, and then moving into narrative, w were thrown away in a really interesting way. All the technical things that I had developed um, and had become second nature um, suddenly were second nature. Um, and it was just, it was euphoric. Well, you know that Einstein said knowledge is limited, but imagination is not, and that's really... Uh, uh, yeah, what and that's saying. what it was, and it, yeah. it, it was. It, it, Once you well, get into imagination, everything is possible. There's yeah. no rules, and there's no. And uh, I would urge you, if you ever get a chance. I mean, Steve's work is um, quite rare. Um, you'll find it in museums. He's, I, hopefully, he's going to have a big retrospective in London next year. But if you ever get a chance to see any of his early work, then go see it, because it, it is. He does something, and he does it in his films as well, which is. Um, take very simple basic images and transform them. And I think that's what art's really about. He transforms them into an emotion. And it is, it's, it is remarkable. And he, he just kind of does it. Um, and it's a very rare and, and wonderful thing. Well, it's like in painting. You can stand in front of Rothko or something and basically it's just, it's so abstract and yet it's powerful. Uh, exactly. And I think that's, you know, that is what a great artist does, is that somehow he touches you, or she touches you, in an unexpected way, um, using an unexpected form. Can yeah. I ask you something, and we'll get off the thing of art, but I'm really <laughs> into art. Um, well, and I'd say you should all be into art. <laughs> <laughs> did he do um, also video art, like, you know, Bill Viola, or was it, installation or are we talking maybe well, no, on, on it, it's both? It, it's both, really. I mean, Steve has always wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, mm. His passion is film. He's, mm -hmm. he's an amazing cineast. He's seen every film ever made um, <laughs> and remembers it. Right. Um, but as a child, his one thing, his one um, great skill was he could draw. And, um, you know, he was born in the... the, the the western part of London, um, you know, in a very uh, you know, lower middle class family. Um, it was his gateway into the world and he got scholarships because of his art. Um, and so he's, he's got a very long and very interesting route um, using his art to finally end up doing what he wanted to do, which was to direct films. And when he directs films, it looks like painting, so... <laughs> yeah. No, it's, um, you know, the, because of the route he's taken, um, you know, he's not, he's not held back by the conventions of modern filmmaking. 
and so nothing is impossible. Okay. The imagination is everything. I have to admit, mm -hmm. when I saw the movie the first time, and it started so lo slow and painterly, and it held on an image for so long, I was just like, oh, no, no, it's so pretentious. <laughs> but then the power of the story really, mm -hmm. you know, um, came through, and all together is just, well, I think you can see it again and again. It's hard, but it's just, uh, you know. Yeah. We're, we're used to a certain so pace complex. of filmmaking. Um, and the idea specifically behind 12 Years a Slave was um, that it should be simple and it should be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that everything we did was to enhance the performance of the actors and give them the time and the space to find the performance. Um, and so. You know, there was no, there was no talk of pacing, because the pacing comes from the actors, and there was no storyboarding, there was no shot lists, oh there's none of that. It's just you go in, you see the, he, Steve would rehearse with the actors, he would call me in, I would see the rehearsal, we would have a brief discussion about the shots, we'd call the crew in, they would see the rehearsal, then we would shoot. So, you know, it's every day was an absolute adventure. Wow. Let me ask you one question about cinematography and then I'm, I'm moving off. But um, so I saw some interview between with the two of you and basically um, there was a talk about looking for truth in, in you know, in the scene, in the, in the shot, and so on and so forth. And I thought maybe because you came from news um, background and documentary, you were always into reality. But sometimes, and, and sometimes, in other words, instead of doing some interesting shot, you really just sit there with the camera close to the actors mm -hmm. and basically record what's going on. Doesn't it sometimes, don't you feel like, oh my God, I really want to do something really interesting <laughs> here, show yeah. what a great cinematographer I am, instead of being an observer in a way. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. that like, the singing shot in Shame is such, such a great example of uh, um, it's just a, yeah, this incredibly powerful moment and you're just you're yeah. pretty much on, on her face in the nightclub the whole time. Well, I think part of the reason it is so powerful is um, because of that simplicity. Uh, we're not used to it anymore. Mm -hmm. we're, we're used to the edit, the edit, the edit, the edit. So that when you walk away from that, um, it really, people look at it. Because mm -hmm. they, you know, it's unusual, it's different. And I think by extending those shots, it you know, draws people into the scene, hopefully. Mm -hmm. and, and it also, um, it expresses a great faith in the actor, right? Um, because when you're committing to, um, um, a long take like that, yeah. you're also committing to that performance. Well, and it is a, a, a great faith, and that's why you, know, you have to choose the right actors. And I think that, again, is one of Steve's great strengths, yeah. is that he, he finds the actors, and then he trusts them to do what they're supposed to do, um, and then works with them until they find it. So, and, you know, usually we don't do more than three takes. Mm -hmm. um, well, <laughs> how many takes did you do of the um, the seventeen minute shot in uh, in Hunger? Uh, three, <laughs> but it's actually twenty one. Originally, it was twenty one and a half minutes long um, uh, on thirty five millimeter. Two perf. Two perf. Thousand foot two perf. Twenty one and a half minutes. Uh -huh. um, but you know, <laughs> it, it, you have actors like Michael Fassbender, um, and it was very interesting because in the the pre production stage. Um, I was invited in to have, a, you know, just to watch Michael and, um, and um, the priest whose name has gone out of my head right now. I'm very bad with actors' names, which is excruciatingly embarrassing on set. Um, oh, you're in good company. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> um, but they, they were sitting there and they were kind of playing around during the rehearsal. And, and Steve said to me, tell them how we're going to shoot this. Huh. And I said, well, you know, we're going to shoot it in one shot. And it took a... And a, a was, it, was it 20 pages on the script? Yeah, it was 20 pages of script, 21 wow. pages. Um, and <laughs> it took them a while to process that. You could see <laughs> that 
the, and suddenly it was like, you know, little, their eyes went ka yes. And suddenly they became very serious. Um, and they actually moved in together and shared an apartment. Mm. And every morning at breakfast, they would run the scene. Every time they bumped into each other, they would run the scene. So that by the time we actually got to the scene, mm -hmm. they had it. And the first take was astounding. Um, uh, unfortunately, it was so good in their Irish, Northern Irish accents were so thick um, <laughs> that you couldn't actually understand what they were saying, um, which was a shame. But we only did it two more times after that. Wow. So, oh. so. I, I remember um, I uh, heard uh, David, uh, David o. Russell say once that he thinks that shooting on film helps the performances because it raises the stakes for the actors. Um, and I'm not sure if you well, I, agree with that. I, I don't know. If it, I think it's probably true. Um, I've, I've shot almost exclusively film um, and only done one tape job with Neil Jordan. Um, it is interesting. Uh, you know, I've done, I've done short feature or short films and commercials and things with uh, um, on tape, and it doesn't enhance performance. Um, by just saying, no, go again, go again, don't stop the camera, keep running, <laughs> keep running. Um, and I don't understand the logic of that. I think people are, are trying to, um, to catch something that doesn't exist, hmm. um, whereas it, it might be better off spending a little bit of time talking to the actors um, and crafting a performance that way. Um, so I, but you know, different people work in different ways. Um, I like the discipline of film. Um, it does focus people's attention because it costs money. It is a huge misunderstanding to think that tape doesn't cost money right? Um, because it all has to be um, dealt with afterwards, especially if you're shooting raw data. You know, the amount of data that you're building up is immense. The storage then associated with that is incredibly time consuming and expensive. You know, that back end thing um, on, on digital, I think, people who stand in the front kind of forget what the ramifications are yeah. at the other end. So, <laughs> uh, and I've never, you know, working with someone like Derek Sian France on um, The Place Beyond the Pines, yeah. Derek is someone who you go into a scene and you just go at it. And that was all handheld, mm. 35 mil, two perf. Um, and they would literally just, you know, put another mag on and, and go and go and go. Right. But he had a reason for that and he had a method to it that was, was so fascinating to watch. Because he would start off, the first take would be, um, OK, let's do it by the books, by the script. And you know, they would get the actors going. And then the next take, he'd come in and say, OK, let's try and do this. Let's try and do that. Or he'd take one of the actors aside and say yeah. something. So that it was a surprise for the other actor. And you would do this incredible exploration of the scene. Um, and then he would say, OK, free for all, whatever you want to do. And then the last take would be, OK, let's take it back to the beginning again. Right. And the process of that was fantastic because the actors were, were able to really explore within the scene itself and to, to come around to a performance um, that was, was fantastic. Hmm. So the, you know, there are ways of doing it. Um, but you know, Derek never said, oh, keep the camera running. Right. <laughs> what, I, what I love about your work, um, or one of the things I love about your work, is um, you, um, you execute these intricate shots on um, 35 millimeter. And sometimes they have this um, um, sensibility that um, they uh, were kind of discovered. Uh, and I'm thinking about um, sort of the opening shot for uh, Beyond the Pines, or there's that wonderful um, camera move in the subway station in um, uh, Shame, where we leave the subway car mm -hmm. and we come up the stairs and then we kind of find our way to the other side of the stairs. And do you have any advice for the um, filmmakers and cinematographers in the audience about how to design a kind of intricate, or how to um, work out an intricate camera move like that? It, it, well, it, it all comes from the story and mm -hmm. the performance. You know, the, um, uh, both of those, the, the, well, the beginning of The Place Beyond the Pines, from the moment I read that, that was one shot. And so you, you suggested that idea? Absolutely, um, to Derek. And he just like, great, <laughs> you know, immediately, if we can make that work. And so we worked very hard on the geography 
of the of the said elements of that, mm -hmm. so that it would work as one shot, because that is it is a state fair, and that those are just the public people. Mm -hmm. We had no control. Were you switching out lights on the Ferris wheel, or that just was? That was all there. Wow. I could I could add lights, but I couldn't take lights away. <laughs> <laughs> and any light I added had to look as if they belonged to the yes. fair. Um, so that you know, we we came out of his little caravan, um, and into the real world. And we had mm. carefully plotted that route through the existing um, fairground, and had placed our tent in a very specific place in relation to everything else, so that we had that amount of time and that amount of visual element. And then, you know, relied upon the real world mm -hmm. to do something for mm -hmm. us. And it was, um, it was fantastic. If you imagine Ryan Gosling suddenly appearing in a state fair. I mean, people literally were in such mm -hmm. shock <laughs> that they, they couldn't do anything. Um, and it also it works with the character. When you see people looking at him with awe, it's like, well, that's because he's the star of right. the fair. And so, you know, we were able to, to get away right. with that. Let's open up for the students. Yeah. Uh, whoever wants to ask a question, please stand behind the mic. And don't be shy. Don't go home and say, I wish I asked. Yeah. This you know, is for you guys. Ab absolutely. I'm here. You know, whatever you want to ask, there's no such, you know, they say there's no such thing as a dumb question. Of course, there are dumb questions. Um, yeah. But I wouldn't but point it out. But sometimes dumb questions <laughs> get, like, really smart yeah. uh, answers. Yeah. I've seen so that. So don't, don't be afraid. You know, I've, I've come all the way here. If you don't ask me questions, I'm going to get really upset. <laughs> you know? uh, first, big congrats on the win last night. You guys deserved it. And uh, my question is about my personal favorite scene in the movie, um, the one long shot whipping scene of Lupita's character. And I just wanted to ask, what was the process and what did it take to bring that scene to life? Okay, um, that uh, <sighs> is a scene that I get asked a lot about. Um, again, uh, it's kind of from the beginning, when, and Steve, as Steve and I were, were working our way through the script, it was like, well, if we can make that work as one shot, let's do that as one shot. Um, and so in my mind, I had always thought of it as one shot um, and had planned accordingly. Um, because? But, because? Why well, do you think it was one shot? One shot. Well, you know, one thing that, that both Steve and I have learned in working together, and, and it started first off in um, Hunger. There's an extended single shot of a beating in that. And um, what, what we think happens is that by not putting an edit in, particularly in scenes of extreme violence, um, the audience is pulled further and further into the story. As soon as you put a cut in, they are subconsciously reminded that it's a film and that they don't need to be upset because it's a film. If there's no cut, there's no escape. Wow. And so the idea was, you know, intellectually, that we will not let the audience escape at this point because this is the culmination of all the horror thrown into this one moment in time. Um, and so that was the idea and the reason why we wanted to do it as one shot. Um, but until we actually saw how the actors were going to do it, we couldn't guarantee that it would be one shot. Um, so, you know, one thing... In, was it done in one day? It was done in half a day. It was <laughs> done in four hours, probably. Um, and, you know, once, once we had seen what the actors were going to do, then we broke it down and, and worked it out and, and went through it beat by beat with the actors because I operate the camera as well. And, you know, for me, this, I live for these handheld shots. They're mm. just, they're such fun. And I mean, pe a lot of people ask me, oh, that must have been a really difficult scene to shoot. Um, and actually, it's my favorite scene. I had more fun doing that scene than anything else, <laughs> perversely. Um, so we spent almost, well, the say three hours probably, breaking it down beat by beat, working with the actors, working out where the camera's going to be. Um, and because, you know, I'm there, I'm the camera, I've got a focus puller, I've got a grip, there's the boom up, there's a whole choreography that has to be worked out for these. And the key is working out the choreography and going through it, break it down into beats, start joining the beats together, and then do it a little bit faster and a little bit faster each time. Um, don't over-rehearse it, but when everyone's ready, or even just before they're ready, then do it. Mm -hmm. So that it's fresh, everyone knows what's going on, 
they, the actors aren't burnt out because they haven't actually been acting. They've only just been doing, going through the motions. Um, and, you know, the first take, I think, is, is, I'm not sure what it's the first take, but we only did three takes. Um, because you cannot expect the actors to maintain that level right. of performance for that long a period of time. And they're the ones who are going through the trauma. It's not me. You know, my only trauma is I've got a 45 pound camera on my shoulder um, <laughs> and it gets bloody heavy by the end of the shot. Um, so, but you have to be respectful to them. Um, and if you do the rehearsals correctly, then it should all go like that. And, you know, again, you've got the right people. And what is happening has come from the story itself. We're not attempting to impose this upon the story. We're responding to how the actors themselves are feeling their characters and their movement, and then interpreting that, interpreting it with the, uh, the movement of the camera. Sweet. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi. Uh, I want to ask you how how is your process of how to choosing uh, between film and digital and between all the cameras and all the options that nowadays is increasing and getting bigger. Yeah. So how do you choose which? If cameras? I can shoot film, I'll shoot film. If they'll pay for it, I'll shoot it. Um, <laughs> for me, you know, I, it, it's been a very interesting process for me over the years. I, when I started in news, we were just I start shooting Super 16 um, for about three months. And then we transitioned into digital. Um, as I moved into documentary, it would, they were just transitioning into, well, it wasn't digital even. It was tape-based formats. Um, documentary, the same. I shot a couple of documentaries on film, and then everything was, was on tape. Um, as I moved into feature films, everything was on film. Um, so I've, I've worked in both those worlds um, extensively and have followed. I shot the first ever um, um, high def feature film um, in Europe, a thing called Chunky Monkey, mm -hmm. um, which if you ever find a copy of it, please burn it. Because um, <laughs> it, was, it was a nightmare. Um, the trailer is on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I learned a very valuable lesson at that point because we were shooting a prototype high def camera, um, which it turned out had no post production facilities within Europe. There was only one facility here in Culver City. Oh my God. Mm. We had a budget. We shot it in 13 days. We had no budget. There was no way that it was coming to Culver City to be um, to be post-produced. Um, and the whole post-production, it took him a year and a half um, before it was actually cut. Um, and we graded it on a um, on a prototype high def grading system, um, which was a nightmare. <laughs> um, and then they lost the master and put it oh out on a digi beta. Ungraded. Oh, okay. um, so I kind of got jaded um, with the whole digital, or not digital, but tape based. Um, that, that brave new world um, did appear neither very brave or very <laughs> new or very happy at that point. Um, and subsequently, I've shot film um, uh, for 90%. For although I was party to the, um, I shot a lot with the D20 and D21 um, for British television and mm -hmm. did the first ever uh, raw data capture project on the D21. So I've been party to a lot of the, 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 the technical developments over time with tape and digital um, and, and know what they do and what they don't do. And so have always chosen film um, for, <coughs> for, for the dramatic, um, for what it does and what, what you can do with it. Particularly you shoot film, post-produced digitally, and you have the best of all worlds at this time. Um, that's changing, you know, it's, um, and I suspect I shot, well, I might have shot my last film on film last year, <laughs> because as the labs disappear, that's the issue. Wow. As the labs go, then film dies. Kodak are going to make film for as long as, as, as anyone's going to shoot it, but if the labs don't survive, then that's it. Yeah. If you. I could um, sort of follow up on that question, yeah, sure. The um, so many of your films, even going back to Wonderland, have been um, widescreen, and I think Wonderland mm -hmm. is, and they've been spherical widescreen for the yeah. most part. Wonderland is probably one of the few Super 16 widescreen movies uh, you'll ever see, except for, um, and then um, the uh, three films with uh, McQueen and then uh, Pines were all, um, were, they, were they all two perf? Uh, no. Um, 
pines was too perf, shame was too perf, hunger was too perf, um, 12 years a slave was four perf. Okay. But all spherical. All spherical. Yeah. What is it about that um, format that um, draws you? Uh, d you know, I, as the operator, and, and just, you know, I, coming out of news and documentary, I've always had the camera on my shoulder, and I'm very used to that, and I love it. Um, composition, for me, is half a cinematography. Mm -hmm. um, that widescreen frame gives you so many wonderful um, possibilities of composition. Mm -hmm. um, and is you can you can so dramatically change um, people's subconscious perception um, about the emotion of a scene simply by where you place a per in, person in the frame, mm -hmm. um, and you can also use that frame to create amazing depth um, to to scenes. It's just for me, it's the most exciting frame there is. And why not anamorphic? Uh, it costs too much. That's there you it. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you know, you. and it's like two perf. Everyone says, "Oh, you know, you, you've used two perf and this, that, and the other." And yeah, I've done. I've probably used two perf more than anyone else in the world at this point. Um, and it's simply for money. Mm -hmm. The director wanted to shoot film. We didn't have the budget. Two perf is half the cost. Ergo, we shot two perf. And you can do a twenty-one minute take. And you can do a twenty-one and a half minute take. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you pre um, that Steve would rehearse with the actors and then come and show you what um, he had, and it would, you know you would uh, determine whatever shots that you would um, do. Um, what uh, what did it what does it take to build that level of trust with the director so that you're able to uh, clearly understand his vision and what he actually wants? Um, what are some of the things that uh, as a cinematographer that you look forward to build that trust. Yeah, uh, 13 years, <laughs> you know. It, 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 it does build up over time. But having said that, um, you know, from day one, um, it, it has to do with personality. If you get on with a director um, and you see the same things, or you over time start to see the same things. Um, you know, it, it, it's like all of these things, it does take time and it takes effort and efforts from both people, from the DOP and the director. Um, and you know, the, the process is, is fairly well known these days. I mean, you have that pre-production period. It's so important as a cinematographer that you get as long a pre-production period as you can. Um, the tendency is these days to try and cut down the, the DOP's time um, in pre-production. And the reality is if you don't have, on, on your average feature film, with say a budget of over a million dollars, if you don't have five weeks pre-production um, with the director, you do not have enough time. Because what happens is you have two weeks where the two of you can really work together. Um, and as it gets closer to the shooting, all these other people are coming on board. He's got actors, he's got rehearsals, he's got rewrites, he's got all sorts of stuff. I say he, but it could be a she. But, um, the, the director's time, um, disappears for those last three weeks. So the reality is you have two weeks, if you're on a five week pre-production, you have two weeks to get everything done with the director. Because as you get closer to the day, your access becomes less and less and less. And so you, you know, you, you've got to come in with ideas. And hopefully the director has ideas as well. So you're looking at films, you're, you're reading books, you're looking at photographs. You're looking at paintings, um, you know, anything that can spark an idea um, and start a discussion between the two of you. I go out and I take a lot of photographs on the location and go through, take the photographs um, back and um, put them through Lightroom and I grade them. I put them in the correct aspect ratio and I go through and I, and I, and I do stuff, which I then show to the director. And we can sit there and look at it. And it can be, oh, well, I like that. I don't like that. And it also, it, you know, that helps me. I become very, um, very attuned to the locations mm. um, and where the, you know, what the compositional elements are and interesting where the light comes from and how they change over time, the locations. Um, and I'm able to show them to the director as well so that they can start to see um, potential for, for the compositions. Um, potential for where the actors might move and how a scene might develop there. 
Um, and I found that to be a, a really useful tool to start talking about specifics. Because <laughs> you know, every director is different. Um, some directors are incredibly visual. Um, and then at the other extreme, there are some directors who could care less about the visuals. Um, they're, they're all about performance. They're all about the actors. And you know, the job of the cinematographer, I think, initially, is to figure out who they are for that director. Because you, know, you work with someone like Spike Lee, he's incredibly visual. Um, you know, he's, he's not going to be told. Yeah. And you, you need to, to develop that relationship. And you hope that, that over time, that, it, that from those discussions and from everything you've done, that a trust will develop. And if you've done your job right, the trust will develop into the, in the second week of shooting. And uh, this has been something that has happened time and time again that uh, sort of midway through the second week, the director will just turn around and say, oh, well, what do you think? Yeah. And that's it, you know, it's changed at that point. And I was very lucky with Steve, you know, we did all that installation work, so that what do you think moment came years ago. Um, but, you know, you've, you've got to put the time in and the effort. And, you know, it's never your job to say no to a director. Um, that's that's someone else's job. Your job is always just say yes, and if you degree, you disagree with what they're what they're doing or what they, you know, how arrogant is that? You know, you've got to have an open mind. If you think there's a better way, then say. Um, and if they if they don't agree, then you know it's their film. But if you're clever, you can still do it anyway, and <laughs> let them think that it was their idea. Um, but that takes a little bit of practice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. God, this is so civilized. I mean, usually <laughs> it's sort of pandemonium. Good yeah. evening. Hello. Good evening, all. Uh, my name is Honor Lynn, and when I came in, I told myself that I was going to look at the film from what I've learned from class and look at it from an objective standpoint and not subjective. My question is to you is that, um, your movies are so profound, like 12 Years a Slave or Hunger. Is it not hard to stay focused on your job? Because I, I found myself becoming more subjective instead of objective and, and being very emotionally attached to the film, to this one or Hunger. Is that not difficult for you? Well, you know, the actual process of making a film is very different to the process of watching a film. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you're, you're working out of sequence. Um, and also you have the, the pressures of getting the day done. So a lot of the time, you, whereas you, you recognize a fine performance um, and you recognize you know, a, a, a nice sequence that's going to work well, um, you, it doesn't mean anything until it's actually cut together and it is given a context within the story. Um, so Can I ask you a yeah. question that, since I saw it? There is a scene where he is hired to play the violin mm -hmm. and plays the violin, people are dancing, and then basically it goes the music from the violin into the score and it just stays on him, on his face, you know, playing the violin. And I was just thinking when you shot that, did you know that this is going to be the transition, or was it something that um, the director did later on with the composer and so on and so forth? No, that was done later on. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it made sense to hold the shot. Well, that's and what that's, it is, uh, you know, because yeah. you, you held the shot. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and that's, you know, um, is, is the beauty of Steve. Yeah. Because he'd. You know, I, I don't stop shooting until someone says cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hold that shot for as long as it's there. Yeah. Um, but he'll sit there and, and you can see, well, I can't see because I'm operating, but I'm told um, that he sits there and, and he's, he is absolutely and completely focused on what's going on and moving, literally moving in his chair with the camera. Um, and then he sits there and he gets really excited and he's sort of holding it, <laughs> holding it, holding it as long as he can. And it's like, cut. Um, so it's, you know, that's, that's his decision. Yeah. Um, but you also, and I also, I always say to, to my first AC, uh, when you're told to cut, don't cut. Hmm. 
keep it running for another couple of beats. Um, because quite often you say cut, the actors will do something. And that something can be really interesting. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good trick. Um, that doesn't always pay off, but you just need it to pay off once <laughs> in a film, and, it, and it's worth it. I am sorry I interrupted yeah, you. Sorry. The answer. Uh, well, yeah. what was the question? <laughs> the answer, <laughs> no, you answered in a way. Because yeah, she asked you, just, how do you keep just being not being emotionally involved? Well, yeah, but it. also, you know, you, you've read the script, you've, you've lived with the script for weeks or months, or sometimes even years. Um, so you know what's going to happen, there are no surprises. Um, and your job is to, is to get it shot. So your focus is on that day, that scene, that shot. Um, and there's always, I mean, the momentum of filmmaking is so crucial. And as the cinematographer, you, you know, you kind of, you play that with that momentum. The first AD is there trying to beat it on and keep it going, but it's kind of your responsibility as well to keep that momentum going. So, you know, there, there's an awful lot more to be thinking about than, oh, well, this is such a, you know, such a sad scene or something like that. Thank you. Chip. Uh, my name is Alistair Conway uh, from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, incredible work. Thank you for those visuals. Question is, you said you went on set without a storyboard or a shot list, and that really blew me away. My question is, well, you've been with Steve for quite some time, and you and him have a working relationship that you understand each other. Yeah. How do you create that kind of security with yourself to go on set without those specific tools to accomplish what you've accomplished? Well, you know, I come from documentaries and, and news. There are no storyboards. There are no, you know, it, it, it's real world. It happens in front of you. So that's been my life. That's what I expect. So, you know, a storyboard, it, very few directors I've worked with use storyboards. Um, they're primarily because they, they cost too much money um, and we don't have enough time in pre-production. Um, but also, you know, the, the idea is um, that instead of trying to, um, you know, um, tie the actors up, into specific movement and specific elements um, is trying to give them the freedom um, to do what they think is right. Now, that doesn't always work for every film you make. I mean, if you're doing a big action adventure film, um, then yes, you need storyboards. If you're doing stunts, you need storyboards because um, you cannot afford to just guess. Um, at how the stunt is going to happen. You need to break it down and be very specific. Um, and, you know, there are other, other types of scenes where storyboards are very helpful. Um, but, you know, like I was saying, every director is different. And, you know, directors find their own way as well. You know, it's like you, no one is born a cinematographer. You, you develop your skills as a cinematographer over time. No one is born as a director. They develop those skills over time. So I think when you start off, storyboards are a very useful thing because they focus people's attentions um, into the specific elements of a scene. But as you become more experienced over time, you know, you start to develop that gut reaction and, um, and respond to ex through your experience to the scene itself. So. Oh, oh thank you. Sure. <laughs> And if I could just follow up on that, um, there's, there's still that moment where you need to figure out where can I put a light, where, where can I put a light in a place that is not going to be in the shot, um, and where can I set lights that are going to sort of tell the story and, you know, mm -hmm. be good portraiture for the actors. And so there's a push and pull there. And, and is there a point where you just, someone says, stop at this point, we need to figure out where we're going to put put things or how do you how do you engage in that process and still meet your schedule um, I'd, I'd, I do a thing which I call area lighting mm -hmm. so I will light the whole area and I treat everything as if it's going to be a steady cam shot so that the camera can move 360 degrees um, and that's I rough that in and get that pre-lit before I arrive um, so that you know and, and also 
part of the, that process of spending as much time on the locations or mm. in the sets as I possibly can and taking the stills is, like I say, so that I understand um, mm -hmm. what the geography is and what the natural light is, the existent light, and try to anticipate mm -hmm. what the actors are going to do. I've got the script. I know what is going to happen. I just don't know exactly where it's going mm -hmm. to happen. Um, so, you know, and usually what happens, well, what you hope is going to happen is that the actors come in, they're only halfway through hair and makeup. <laughs> so they do their performance, we see what's going to happen, they get sent off then to finish their hair and makeup, and then I have time to, to, to really finesse the lighting at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I've sort of learned that, you know, if you approach every th setup as if the camera's going to go everywhere, then, you know, you, you can't go wrong, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although I have gone horribly wrong in the past. <laughs> so, kind of yeah. going, so kind of going off from that was kind of my question is like, what are your favorite tools to use to light 360? Because I read that you, you like to use 360 lighting. So I was kind of curious how you actually achieve that. Which, what, what kind of tools do you use to actually? Well, it, it, it really depends on the, the approach to the film itself um, and, and the budget. If I can, you know, if, if for example, and of course every, every location, every scene is, is kind of unique. Um, but say for example, um, um, uh, it's uh, in, a, in a big room in a stately home and it's a costume period drama. Um, I'm going to want to get 18Ks outside the window. Um, usually on a costume period drama, you can't see out the windows anyway. So I'm going to put a full grid on those windows. Um, back the 18K off, um, you know, 100 yards, um, and use that as, as, my, as my key source. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, sometimes that's all you need. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very much of the, the, the belief that if one light will do it, then use one light. Um, you know, which comes from the documentary background. Mm -hmm. I did uh, a three-month documentary in the Middle East um, in the late 80s. Um, about Islamic fundamentalism. I had three mini red-haired Ianaros, and by the third day I had blown up every single bulb but uh -huh. one. Mm -hmm. And so all I had for the whole of that of filming was one light. Um, and I learned more about lighting um, <laughs> over that period mm -hmm. of time than I have ever in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so if I can use one light, I use one light. Um, mm -hmm. But then just slowly build from there. You know, uh, Billy Williams, I did a, uh, I don't know if you know Billy Williams, one of um, England's, the world's greatest cinematographers. Um, I did a, a, a seminar with him at the National Film and Television School um, in Rockport, Maine, or the International Film and Television School uh, in Rockport. And um, he gave such fantastic advice. And the one thing he said was that, you know, some days you, you will walk onto a set and you just won't know what to do. Um, so the first thing you do is put up a light, any light, anywhere. Huh. Um, and that does two things. Um, it gets the crew moving, and this is part of the momentum thing. Um, it gives you a bit of time to think, and also when that light goes on, um, as soon as it goes on, it should be obvious whether it's right or wrong. Hmm. And you know that that is fantastic advice. Mm. Um, you would hope to have the right light in the right place before you even arrive, <laughs> but you know stuff happens. Yeah. You know you lose locations, locations change during a day. You you arrive somewhere and what you thought was going to happen isn't going to happen. So you've always got to be you know ready to busk it um, and have you know an approach. Um, but you know, the, the, the one light thing, that it's very difficult because say if you're doing a specific genre type film, um, as, you know, the, the demands can be very different. I, I tend not to work with backlight unless I can actually source the backlight um, in, in the shot. Although, you know, on, um, there have been films I've worked on where stylistically they wanted, the director felt that the, we would want a backlight everywhere. Um, and then that starts to become slightly more problematic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really, you know, it's, it's hard to, to be specific yeah. um, because there are so many but, generalities. Well, let me ask you about, because um, it's a situation these students encounter all the time, that um, white wall department in, in shame, um, certainly that's, uh, uh, these students are 
lighting up kind of light color departments all the time. How did you approach that? Were the lights on dimmers or did you um, hang stuff off the ceiling? Or? What lights? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, on something like that, the, um, it, it, it was such a key element to his character. Because right. when I first walked into the, into the apartment, um, and it's on the 32nd floor, Wow. Um, and it was like, okay, well, how the fuck am I going to do this? Um, it's all white walls. It's on the 32nd floor. Um, there are another 20 floors above us. Um, <laughs> um, but, I mean, the, the whole reason we were in that specific apartment was that it was, um, it was north facing. And you all understand what that means, hopefully. Um, if you don't, then, um, uh, you know, the sun, if you're in the northern hemisphere, the sun is always to the south. So if you have a south-facing window, the sun will be coming in to that window at some point during the day, if not all of it. Um, when you're working on an extended scene, which might take three days, you need to be able to control the light completely. Um, one of the great things and great tricks to do is find windows that are north-facing. The sun never comes in that window. And because of that, the continuity of the light coming through stays fairly constant throughout the day. Um, so you don't have to try and block it off. Um, you don't have to, 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 you know, well, sometimes you do have to augment it, particularly at the beginning and the end of the day as you start to use, lose your ambient light. Um, but it's that simple. Find, find north-facing windows. You get a beautiful soft quality of light that comes through a north-facing window as well. Um, and that apartment was north-facing. And more importantly, it was north facing and the building across from it, um, there was a whole block of no buildings so that we had that skylight and you know, that fantastic consistent skylight um, because there was nothing bouncing back off in the air building into, into the room. But also if you, the building that is directly across from it is the Empire State Building. Hmm. And one of the things that, that, that me and Steve had spoken about for shame the whole time was that we wanted to be quintessentially New York. We wanted to get in as many of those New York landmarks as we possibly could, but we wanted to hide them um, so that most people wouldn't know what they were looking at. And you know, every time I watch the film, I just think, ah, oh, that's the Empire State Building, and no one knows. <laughs> um, but we know. Um, and so you know, by having the fact that I didn't have to worry about direct sunlight, um, and also knowing that almost all the scenes, daylight scenes inside there, were relatively short, um, and you know, accepting the fact that those white walls were an integral part of his character. And also knowing that when I got into the grade, I could really screw around with those walls if I needed to. Mm -hmm. um, I felt very confident that we could make it work. For the nighttime interior stuff, um, my gaffer Bill Newell um, had built these, these wonderful little boxes um, that were sort of a, a soft light box, um, but really lightweight. And we could just kind of pop them up onto the wall wherever we liked. And so, you know, that's what we did. We would use those. I would, you know, like I said, I always try if, uh, to source the lighting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I work with the designer um, very carefully um, to get practicals within the space um, so that I can, you know, I have reasons for there to be light um, and use those practicals then as the guide to where the light comes from. Um, and so would stick these little boxes above the lights and use china balls, use a lot of china balls for that as well. Um, and, you know, just sort of build the scene from the reality and then have a look at it. And if it didn't look right, then mm. change it. Yeah, so it's yeah thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much for coming. My name is David. And my question is, uh, I think you are probably at a point in your career now where you can be pretty choosy with the projects that you do. Uh, my question is, what is an important factor in selecting your project, and how does that process work out for you? Um, I've always been very choosy about the projects I've done. Um, uh, in, you know, as a documentary cameraman and as, um, as a features cameraman, um, and I have waited months um, unemployed for the right films to happen, um, and I have designed my life um, so that I can go for months um, without an income. You know, I don't, I don't do, I don't have a flashy lifestyle. Um, and I think that's the key. 
you know, uh, you're going to give your whole life to whatever film, or you should be giving your whole life to whatever film you're going to be doing. Um, so do the films that, that you think are worth it um, at, at any point in your career. But the, the caveat I would give to that is that in the early part of your career, as you're starting, you know, just shoot anything. Because <laughs> it's about experience. And the only way you get experience as a cinematographer is by shooting, nothing else. You can read books, you can watch movies, you can talk to your friends, you can do whatever you like, but you will not progress unless you shoot and shoot and shoot and be very critical about everything you shoot and look at it and learn from every day's work that you do. Um, you know, I, it's, it's great. I, I am getting offered more scripts, which is always wonderful. Um, but it is about the story. You know, whenever I get a script and I read every script I'm sent, um, the first time I read it, I don't read it as a cinematographer. I just read it as Joe Punter, thinking, is this a good story? Did this move me in some way? Is this interesting? Is this original? Is there something here um, that, that, that's worth the effort? Um, and if there isn't, then I say no. I mean, in, in the last couple of months, I've had all these hundred million dollar scripts come through and I read them and it's like, well, I can't do that. I mean, that's crap. Um, and, you know, it's upsetting the agents because it's like, this is, you know, I've done $20 million film, I need to do a 50 now, and then I need to do a 100. And it's like, well, why? Um, I'm not really, yeah, I would love to do, say, a Bond or, you know, a Terminator or something like that, but uh, I'm not going to just do a film because they've got a lot of money. Um, so it's the story. And then once I've read the story, it's meeting the director. And, you know, it's the story and the director together that, that make a film worthwhile. Because if it's a good director, they're going to get a good cast, and you're going to make something interesting. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Hi, I'm Anu. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your um, academy success. And my question is regarding the, your interview in um, uh, American Cinematography magazine. So you said very interesting thing in that uh, we shot uh, we shot uh, in the movie whatever it was needed for the story, as opposed to that what we might need to tell the story. So that's very interesting fact. So can you just elaborate more on that? Because you know the uh, movie like this, which is basically you know uh, so put it from the or just you know it's adapted screenplay. So it's, it's, it's more of a well-thought movie. So how do you imagine and just implement with that thing? Well, you, you know, that's up to the director. Um, and the, the approach that, that Steve has and, you know, the one that I, I enjoy working the most is that the, the decisions about the shots are made on the day and they're not made in the edit. Um, so if you say coverage to Steve, he spits <laughs> and says, why would I do that? Um, you know, it, it is about making decisions instead of just trying to accumulate a bunch of images that then retrospectively can be turned into something. The idea is to do it there, um, you know, and to, and to be bold about those decisions. Um, and, so, and so that's what we did. And there's a, a big tendency, I haven't worked in America that much, um, and I think this is more of a European tradition, um, the, you know, the concept of the auteur director, um, you know, making those decisions on the day. Uh, and I'm, you know, I've worked on films here now where suddenly it's two cameras on everything um, and you're just shooting and shooting and shooting, every eye line. Huh. And it's like, uh, well, why are we doing this? Um, so, it, you know, it's... it's it's a different aesthetic and a different approach um, to filmmaking. I'm much more comfortable with that European approach of actually deciding what you're going to do and doing it. Thank you. So. Hello, thanks for coming in tonight. Um, I'm a cinematography student and I just want to know, starting in um, news and documentary and then your transition into film, how did you stay motivated? Were there times at the beginning where you just felt like maybe film is 
too complex or there were moments that maybe there were some experiences that she had and weren't the best and what are your tips to stay motivated to pursue a cinematography career? Um, ooh, motivated. I, it's, um, you know, I, I never meant to be a cinematographer. I, at the age of sort of 16 and 17, I was a, a, a remarkable pseudo intellectual um, and <laughs> thought that I was going to be a writer philosopher. Um, and so I've, I've ended up doing cinematography through circumstance. Um, and for a long time, never, you know, I'd, uh, I didn't actually want to be a cinematographer until I'd been doing it for like 12 years, um, okay. oddly. Um, so motivation, my motivation was, you know, the, the world of news is, is I, I'm a curious person and I, I always want to know what's going on. And as a news cameraman, you travel the world and you were there as events were happening. So the motivation for that was, you know, you get to travel the world and you see these things for real. Um, the, the downside of that is that, that a lot of those things you see for real aren't very pleasant. Um, and, um, you know, after a while you realize, well, if I keep doing this, I'm going to die. Um, so the motivation there was to get out of it. Um, and so I moved into documentaries. Documentaries, fantastic. Again, you know, you presented the world. Um, but what you begin to realize is after, you know, you've done, I did 10 years of news and then 10 years of documentaries, after 20 years, um, a lot of these things are just the same things happening over and over again. And that all you're doing is being reactive. And you, you begin to realize, well, every riot's going to go the same way. You know, they always do. There is a structure to them. And so you, you know that you just have to be in the right place at the right time. You can do this and this and this and, you know, all the tricks. And it becomes boring. Um, and so the motivation was to not be bored at that point. And I thought, and I did this, this seminar, it was a week long seminar with Billy Williams. Um, and suddenly I discovered ambition. It was like, bloody hell, I've been doing this for, for all these years and I love it. And now I'm beginning to understand it. Um, and it was at that point that, that really things changed for me. It was like, God, you know, this is, this is the best job in the world. This is what I should be doing. Um, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it well. So I, I want to do feature films. Um, and, you know, so it, it, circumstances mm. kept me going. And, you know, even as a news cameraman, um, I tried to, to do something different every day. You know, find a new piece of equipment, approach the subject in a different way. And documentary is exactly the same. And I do it the same in feature films always looking for doing, looking for a way of doing it differently and keeping an open mind to the possibilities of everything so that it doesn't become like a normal job. You know, although basically we do the same thing every day, we go and make images. Um, it, it's, every day is different and unique and it's sort of grasping that and exploring that um, that keeps me going. Um, so it's, you know, motivation is, is something that's got to come from within you. Um, but, I, you know, if you, if you really are doing the job right, it's never going to be boring. Because mm. there will, every day will be a challenge or should be a challenge. Um, and every day you should be a little bit scared that, you know, it's not going to work. And that's, you know, kind of what keeps me going. The day I wake up and I think, oh, well, this is going to be an easy day, um, I might as well quit. You know, it's, uh, it's, then you're not doing it right, I don't think. I don't know if, if that answers your question. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, as, as we're uh, winding down here, I have a question for you, which is you've worked with um, many fantastic directors, Spike Lee and Michael Winterbottom, and they, they all... Um, uh, McQueen, they, they all have different styles. Is there a, a common thread that you've seen amongst the great directors you've worked with? And uh, maybe that's um, something you could share with the uh, directing students and uh, filmmaking yeah. students in the crowd. Okay, uh, the common thread is that they, they are all decisive, they are all curious, um, and they all have an open mind. Um, but the most important bit is they are decisive. They make decisions, um, and you know that is what it's all about. As a director, you are there to direct people. If you cannot give them 
a way to go and say yes or no, um, then what's your role? <laughs> and is uh, there anything in common amongst the directors that have you've worked with that have had a pretty hard time? Or is there a common mistake? Indecision. Indecision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it, 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 it's interesting. I've, 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 I've been fortunate. I've worked with a huge range of, of directors. Um, and like I say, they're all unique. And, and it is often, it can be quite difficult to figure out what your role is um, in relation to them. But once you've got that, then everything should f fall together. And, you know, sometimes, like I say, you, you end up, doing all the visual elements. Other times you end up doing none. You know, you, it's, um, the ones that are most interesting and most fulfilling are those where you actually collaborate together. And you're working not just with the director, but also with the designer, with the hair and makeup, with the um, costume, with sound. I mean, don't forget sound. Sound gets treated so badly, <laughs> and it's wrong. It's you know, it's um, you know this saying that you hear so often on a set is, "Oh, fuck sound." Um, it, 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 there is nothing that will enhance your images more than good sound, and you should do everything within your power to help the sound department to get that good sound. If you don't, then you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, it's it's that simple. Um, but I've gone off track there a little bit. I, I rant about sound mm -hmm. um, because I think it, it is such a mistake um, to, to devalue the quality of their work. Um, particularly in this country, you have so much, um, uh, uh, everything is dubbed afterwards. In Europe, we don't do that. We don't have the budget to do that. It is 90% of the film will be acquired on the set. Um, and I've worked on some films where it's been 100%. Um, but for that to happen, you have to collaborate with your father head of department. But it is that collaboration, and I think that's the whole point I was getting back to, is that you collaborate with everyone. Um, and if everyone collaborates together, you end up with something like 12 Years a Slave. You know, it is, it's is so much. Yeah. One um, of the reasons why, um, because here, one of the reasons also it gets dubbed so much all the time is because it's wall-to-wall -wall music in American movies. It's mm. like a nightmare, you know. It's in the old days, I mean you watch Bernard Herman and you know, even if you watch Taxi Driver, it's like the minute the actors start talking, the music starts coming down so you can hear what people say. Now I go to the movies, I'm like, what did he say? Mm. I don't know. What did he <laughs> say? I don't know, you know? And part of it as you say, not enough respect for it, for the sound and Oh, we'll fix it later, and then it's like you know, it get overpowered by constant music, which is really mm -hmm. crazy. So I have a question for you, and um, there see like when they work in the cotton field, that when you look at it, there's like a shadow on the left. In other words, it's you don't really see everything really, really clearly and so on and so forth. Is, is it something that Steve gave you the freedom to shoot like this? Is it something that he said, let's do it, but don't give the whole, you know? Um, I, you know, do, having that relationship over such a long period of time, we don't really talk that much. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, By the and, way, Janusz Kaminski was here and he said the same thing about Spielberg. Yeah. We, he shows him at the beginning when they talk a little bit, you know, they talk yeah. about it and sometimes Stephen doesn't understand what he says. He says, okay, I'm going to show you and does a little test. Yeah. And once he said it's okay, they don't talk that much. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I will present a frame to Steve um, and he'll say yes or no. And, you know, more often than not, he says yes. Um, on um, 12 Years a Slave, if I tried to do anything fancy, he'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. Yeah. You know, um, but it, it, it takes time to develop that rapport. If it's a director who I haven't worked with before, um, then, you know, the viewfinder is, is a fantastic tool so that you can actually show the director the composition, show the director the move so that they, in their head, can understand what it is you're talking about. 
um, and see um, exactly. And, and it's like that for choices of lens. Um, you know, Steve has never said to me, oh, we'll shoot this on a 50, because he could care less. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's kind of... He just wants the effect. Yeah, of but he'll see if, if, I, if I throw up a 50 and it's like, oh, it doesn't feel right. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, well, is it wider? Is it tighter? Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll throw up another lens and, it's, and, and work it out and see. But it's, it's usually, it's a gut feeling as opposed to any, any great intellectual. Okay, let um, me ask process. you a question. Here in the movie, he talks with Brad Pitt, and Brad Pitt agrees, basically, to uh, contact his people. And then you cut to, I can't pronounce his name, Chetwell. Chuitel. Chuitel. And it's just him hmm. for like a minute or two, just him, basically. He's thinking, he's just kind of looking around, he's in that space. And then you cut to, and suddenly he's in the field and this, um, the people from the north are coming. What was that thing? Was it a, just a transition between one and the other? I wasn't quite clear no, the purpose the, of... Well, that, we picked, that was a pickup shot that mm. we did. We, 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 after we finished principal photography, um, Steve edited for a couple of months. And um, it was obvious that there were a couple of things that weren't working and a couple of things that needed to be added. So we had another four days filming. And in those four days filming, one thing that, that Steve felt and again, it was a gut feeling that, that there was no moment where it was just us and Chiwetel. And he just wanted a beat of, of, of the audience and Chiwetel together. And mm. that was it. So that shot is in a car park in an industrial estate ah. in New Orleans, <laughs> shot on a Sunday with just me, a focus puller, um, and a clapper loader and a grip. Um, and Chiwetel, I mean, it, it's my favorite shot of the whole film. Um, because of the level of performance. Yeah. Um, it is phenomenal. You see the whole of his life in his eyes. Um, and that little glance into the lens. As we were filming it, the hairs were standing up on the back of my head. And the look into the lens was like a physical blow um, to the chest. And it was like, whoa, you know, there's something special happened in that moment. Yeah, in you terms can't of performance. quite tell why, what, whatever. Yeah later but at that moment you connect with him it's just you and him as yeah. you said and, and there was and there was no context for it at the time exactly. we shot it it was just something that steve felt the film was wow. missing yeah and so so that's what we did and i'm, I'm so glad tova brought that up because um the um there are so many moments in the movies you photograph where we're really just um staying on a close-up for a long time and is there a way that you approach portraiture or lighting the close-up that um, uh, sort of in, informs getting these amazing performances? Or, um, or do you have a philosophy about how you, you approach lighting, lighting someone, uh, someone for a close-up? Do I have a philosophy? Yeah, you know, I start off with the area lighting. Mm -hmm. And then when you go into the close-up, you can cheat whatever you like right. to a certain extent. Um, so it, it's finding the, the cheat that works best for the, the, the emotional content of the performance. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's no specific thing. It's, it's a response mm -hmm. to, to the overall light, mm -hmm. but also what the actor is doing at the time. Do you, find, do you try to find time for makeup tests or um, time to um, photograph uh, your lead in advance to kind of figure out how to attack yeah. What I Line. what I try to do again, you know, most of the films I've done, the budgets have been very low, and mm -hmm. tests are like, huh, you know, um, and they're not studio films, you know, so you don't have studio executives insisting that you see hair and makeup and costume mm -hmm. and everything else. And I I have done films where we've done tests and I find them very tedious. Um, I'd rather <laughs> be out doing something else in that time. Um, but the um, you know, what I try to do, if I'm not going to get testing time with the actors, is I try to go into rehearsal mm -hmm. um, and sit there and watch the actors in the rehearsal. And that has two really important um, aspects to it. One is to see how deep their eyes are, because that's all it boils down to at the end of the day, huh. um, mainly with the men. 
and, and the women, whether they have bits on their noses and how crooked their noses are. Um, and those become kind of the key things. Um, and, you know, just to get a sense of the shape of the face mm -hmm. and watch them as they move around the room and, and try and think, well, okay, the, you know, in these certain scenes, for example, where I'd conceived of it as being heavy top light, um, you see the actor and it's like, oh, bloody hell, that's not going to work. Or if I'd still thought of it as being a strong cross light, it's like, ooh, <laughs> you know, that ain't going to work either. Um, so it gives you a chance. Um, and it also, the, the, even more importantly, is that you meet the actors at that point so that they don't arrive on the set never having even spoken to you mm. um, and have no idea who you are. You know, that rapport that you develop with the actors is as is, is important as any other relationship on the set. So you want to try and get in there as early as you can. Because you, as the DOP, you, you have to, you know, part of the job is making them comfortable so that they, they feel they can trust you. Um, they feel that you have their best interest at heart um, and that they don't have to worry about you so that they can just get on and, and do the performance. Um, so the earlier you can meet them and, and see them and figure out how they're going to work in terms of, of the close-up, the, the better off you're going to be. Wow. Well, it's getting late. You partied hard last night, so <laughs> we wanted... I cannot tell you how much we appreciate that you came here. Oh, no. It's been a real pleasure.